In this age of confusion, we see many competing ideas on how Catholics should understand the papacy. The most extreme forms, hyperpapalism, sedevacantism, both include an over-exaggerated sense of the papacy. And then it seems like on the other extreme is synodality, which at least on paper seems to diminish the power of the papacy. Could, however, another Catholic approach to the papacy in these issues be a better way forward? That's what we're going to talk about today on Crisis Point. Hello, I'm Eric Sammons, your host and the editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Before we get started, I just want to encourage people to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Let other people know about it. Also, you can follow us on social media at Crisis Mag. You can subscribe to our daily email newsletter at our website, crisismagazine.com. Okay, so we have return guests. It is Father Jason Sharon. He, he was ordained to the priesthood in the Ukrainian Catholic Church in the Diocese of St. Jehoshaphat in 2008. He has served in parishes in North Carolina, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. He is currently the pastor of Holy Trinity Ukrainian Catholic Church in Carnegie, Pennsylvania, and as pastor of Our Lady of Perpetual Help in Wheeling, West Virginia. He also serves on the Presbyteral Council of the Ukrainian Catholic Diocese of Parma, Ohio. Welcome back to the program, Father. Good to be back in a time of crisis. Yes, that's right. Exactly. So I, I wanted to get you on because I saw you on the Ben Shapiro show and you were excellent, by the way. Uh, I was very impressed, when, uh, especially when uh, Shapiro was asking about Pope Francis and the papacy, because obviously he is not Catholic. He does not understand church politics. He does not understand church theology. And so having you on there to explain it, I thought was uh, was very good. And I want to talk about similar topics today because, I mean, there's just so much confusion and crisis going on. We have, I mean, just recently we have the news. Father James Altman, a very popular priest, has has said that he does not believe Jorge Bergoglio is the pope. Uh, We have Bishop Strickland potentially being asked to resign, being forced to resign uh, for reasons that seem a bit mysterious to us all. Uh, we have the synod the synod on synodality coming up, which at least seems to be threatening to maybe try to overturn or undermine church teaching. We're, we're all getting crazy, and I think a lot of this has to do with ecclesiology. And one of the things that Eastern Catholics, such as yourself, have it's an ecclesiology which is faithfully Catholic, but it is different than most of us Latin Catholics assume. And so I wanted to really talk about that. Now, to start off, why don't you just give a little bit of your background? Did you grow up Eastern Catholic? Uh, If not, how did you become Eastern Catholic? Just a a little bit about your own story as an Eastern Catholic priest. Yeah, I I grew up uh, in rural Ontario, uh, loving hockey and baseball. That was my religion, basically. Uh, I wasn't very good at either of them, but I I loved them both. And uh, I had a conversion when I was around 15 or 16. And... um, that brought me uh, in back into the practice of, of the faith. Um, I was baptized when I was a kid. Um, and then I finished high school. And I thought, what's the most, uh, the greatest thing I can do with my life for God? And, and that is, of course, be a priest, get, you know, go all in. Um, so I went to the seminary, loved it, had a great, great time uh, up in Ogdensburg, New York, Wadham's Hall. And um, was this just a diocesan, uh, like a, a regular Latin diocesan seminary? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, um, while I was there, I, uh, I had a spiritual director, uh, who was, um, um, from my home diocese, you know, who was by ritual and you say by ritual today and people think what, you know, it's, they think it's some <laughs> by something else, but by ritual means they have permission from, uh, the Vatican to celebrate, uh, two or more of the, uh, ancient liturgies of the church. And, uh, he said to me, you know, Jason, you're, um, your spirituality is really more akin to the, the Eastern churches. Uh, and I thought, what, what are you talking about? These guys are all schismatics. You know, they're not, I'm Catholic. Um, and he didn't press the matter, but uh, life went on. And I found myself uh, a year later uh, doing apostolic work for the summer in Ukraine, of all places, teaching uh, English to seminarians from uh, the former Soviet Union who just came out of the underground. Um these people went to Siberia, their forefathers, uh, you know, from 40, 1946 until 1991, went to Siberia over an ecclesiological principle, you know, union with the Pope. They weren't asked to deny the faith 
in the Eucharist and the divinity of Christ or anything like that, you know, they were asked to go to Siberia over uh, an ecclesiological principle. So I was really impressed and uh, fell in love with their liturgy. And I was supposed to go and study in Rome. And I asked for a year off to get my head and heart straightened out. And uh, I fell in love with the Ukrainian church, met my wife there. And uh, so I, I actually uh, uh, changed uh, ritual churches and became uh, Ukrainian Catholic. So that was back in uh, in 2000. Okay. And then you're ordained. Uh, how many kids do you have? Seven. Seven kids. Uh, eight number. years of seminary. Four in the Latin rite. Four in the Byzantine rite. Um, soon, yeah. So uh, that's that's basic basic biography. Okay, great. Now. I was first exposed to Eastern Catholicism about 25 years ago. And one of the things that first struck me was what I, I, I guess I would call a different attitude towards the papacy. Now, some Latin Catholics might look at it as almost not respectful enough or not obedient enough or something. But you, as you just explained, you literally are talking about Catholics who were willing to go to Siberia because of their loyalty to the Pope. So I think it's hard to really accuse Eastern Catholics of not being loyal to the Pope when they literally are doing things like that. But at the same time, it is different. It seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it is different how you approach the papacy. Could you give kind of just a an overview of the, the kind of the Eastern Catholic view of the papacy and maybe how it might differ a little bit from at least the attitude of, of most Latin Catholics towards the papacy? It's uh, best understood by um, anyone who's taken a, a theology class in the 1980s or 90s, you know, would know what I'm referring to when I say a, a high Christology and a low rising Christology out of this German school. But, uh, you know, that that is a, an analogous way of understanding it, because in historically, uh, speaking of Christology, uh, there are schools, I think, of the, uh, you know, the Coptic tradition out of Alexandria with Athanasius of Alexandria and Cyril of Alexandria. And, you know, the starting point is uh, the divinity of Christ. And then, uh, you know, you, you get to the point of affirming his humanity. So both are affirmed, but the, the starting point is different. The Antiochian tradition from Antioch, you know, where Peter was first bishop before he was in Rome, uh, and up from whom we have, for example, um, you know, St. Ephraim and uh, John Chrysostom uh, before he went to Constantinople, is, you know, a school that really... Uh, their gift was uh, identifying the humanity of Christ. You may think later on in the Latin tradition of the Sacred Heart devotions, but, you know, the, the humanity of Christ. And then they arrive at completely affirming uh, the divinity of Christ as well. And so that uh, model uh, is transferred to our understanding of uh, church as well. So there's a model of church which first affirms uh, the papacy, and then it gets to the point of affirming, you know, the legitimacy of local ecclesiastical authority. The Eastern emphasis is to first uh, look at the successor of the apostle in the local church and his fatherhood in the local church presiding over the local church in the Eucharistic sacrifice. And then it radiates out from there to the metropolia of his archbishop, and from there to the wider synod uh, of bishops who are not just token members of a college, but they you know, co have a collegial synodal function of making decisions together, uh, not programmatically by some imposition from above, but organically out of uh, time spent in prayer together. Um, and then from that, if something can't be resolved at that level, then it goes up another level to, um, you know, the, the patriarch and over the patriarch, if that still cannot be resolved, then it's, it's resolved to uh, our father in faith, the church that presides in love, Rome, uh, with the Pope. So both East and West affirm the authority of the local church and uh, the Eastern Catholics, that is, affirm both the authority of the local uh, father, the bishop, and of the, uh, the, the, the father we have in Rome. Uh, the starting points are different, though. Now, how exactly does this then differ from 
how do Eastern Catholics differ from Eastern Orthodox when it comes to this? Because obviously Eastern Orthodox are uh, not in communion with Rome, but they have a very similar ecclesiology to what you just described. What really is, uh, how, how are they different then? That's a very good question. Um, even the Orthodox, even the Orthodox acknowledge the primacy of Peter. Now, uh, they would say it's a primacy of honor, and they understand that uh, to be the primacy of honor that, um, you know, the Council of Nicaea gave to Jerusalem as a senior rank, um, something that, you know, popes might do today with uh, an old bishop who's a friend who's about 90 years old. They'll give him the red hat. It's just an honorific. And uh, that's what the early church, uh, the Council of Nicaea did for uh, Jerusalem. There weren't a whole lot of Christians living there, but it was the city of our Lord. So they, they gave it a primacy of honor without any teeth. Um, and that's how the Orthodox uh, uh, tend to view the papacy today. But at the time in the fourth century, there was uh, also a primacy of honor. They used the same word, unfortunately, the same term. But primacy of honor uh, was also used in referred in, uh, to dioceses uh, that had real jurisdiction. And that was Rome and then Constantinople. So both of the term primacy of honor can be confusing because it was used at Nicaea to refer to, you know, uh, a place like Constantinople with real jurisdiction after Rome. And it was also used in a ceremonial sense for uh, the Bishop of Jerusalem. And uh, today, uh, most Orthodox would refer to uh, the, the, the See of Peter having a ceremonial jurisdiction of honor. Um, but the, the, uh, the Eastern Catholics, who are in the same liturgical family uh, as the Orthodox uh, from, you know, from the Ukrainian Orthodox and the Ukrainian Catholic, uh, you think of the, um, the Coptic Orthodox, the Coptic Catholic, they're in the same liturgical family. But the Eastern Catholics would see that jurisdiction as not being simply ceremonial, but having you know, full, immediate you know, universal uh, uh, authority. Okay, so now how, how would, as an Eastern Catholic, how do you view Vatican I and what would be, I think, considered the, the rise of Ultramontism, where you have a situation where the Pope is not just, I mean, the court of last resort, so to speak, but he really becomes, uh, it it's becomes much more of a top-down organizational structure and how it's practiced. I mean, I guess there's actually two questions here because there's obviously the theology uh, uh, and ecclesiology of Vatican I itself, and then there's the actual practice and how it's done. So let's first just focus in on Vatican I itself. The universal jurisdiction, the infallibility of the Pope, is there any squeamishness, I guess, from Eastern Catholics about the language used at Vatican I, or is it, or is it understood differently than you think the typical Latin would understand it? How do you guys approach that? Yeah, th this is a very long, complicated bowl of spaghetti. Uh, <laughs> but there is, you know, our approach, I think, is best summarized by the approach of Patriarch uh, Maximus at the First Vatican Council, who did sign it, you know, uh, on behalf of the you know whole Eastern Church, all, all of the Eastern churches, in in, in a sense, um, with a, a subscript that you know the Pope is is infallible insofar as it doesn't prejudice the authorities of the uh, the, the patriarchs of the East, and so uh, I think that that speaks for uh, many of the of the Eastern uh, we Easterners that uh, in those areas of jurisdiction which do not pertain to uh, the legitimate potestas, the legitimate power and authority of uh, the Eastern patriarchs and their synods and their bishops, then uh, yes, it, it, it def we defer to Rome. Um, and uh, the idea, this is where now it gets ex a little very, it gets complicated because on the one hand, you have, you had Benedict who, said, you know, prior to being Pope, that uh, going forward in discussions with the role of the papacy vis-a-vis -vis the East, uh, that we need to use the first millennium as uh, a basis uh, from which we can proceed. 
And uh, the idea of there being a universal jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome over the, the, the minutia of these other ancient sees, you know, it doesn't exist in, in, in the uh, first millennium. And then you have uh, internal struggles in the, in, the, in the Latin church in the second millennium uh, with, between, with intra cardinals and popes and extra kings and the church. And then you have the rise of conciliarism. You think of Constance uh, in uh, the, the um, I think 1440. Uh, and, and then that whole question of conciliarism explodes, which is, is, is horrendous. It's, it's, not, it's not consistent with, with uh, you know, the, our Catholic belief. And then you have the Anglicanism, and then you have the reaction uh, embodied in the you know uh, 1870s um, and the time leading up to the 1870s with ultramontanism, in which the the Pope is seen as a super bishop, that he is seen as um, a man who is uh, almost like a demigod, uh, without need of any intermediary authority between he and uh, the people. Uh, so that's problematic. That that super ultra maximalist view of papal authority is not consistent with uh, the the model of the early church. So it it, it does get convoluted, um, and um, I think that this the, the healthy balance is true synodality, not the 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 kind of the bait and switch that's being used right now with that term um, in in twenty twenty three, but. It is uh, an understanding of authority that comes from the bishops who are presiding in love as fathers in Christ over their flocks. And they, in consultation with other bishops in the Eucharist, um, come to see what Christ has them affirm here and now. Uh, and that's the authority of a bishop is to feed the flock uh, in faith and morals by affirming uh, that which has been handed down, adding nothing to it, subtracting nothing from it, uh, but feeding the flock with it. Um, and uh, papal infallibility is is um, it's a very narrow term, and it does not uh, refer to papal encyclicals. It does not refer to apostolic letters. It does not refer to mota propria. It doesn't refer to airplane interviews. Uh, none of those things are infallible and uh for eastern eastern uh catholics um you know most especially uh those things often don't refer to us because they're often uh, jurisdictional statements referring to the latin church um but uh this is where we are is it's a, a result of poor catechesis and people not understanding the the nature of infallibility which all bishops share in you know, insofar as they're in communion with, with, uh, with Peter. Uh, but it is very narrow, and it is a, what I would call a negative charism. It doesn't guarantee that the Holy Father speaks uh, precisely. It doesn't guarantee that he speaks in a timely manner. Um, it doesn't guarantee that he even speaks with all the depth that's needed. It simply guarantees by the word of Christ, the power of the Spirit, that what he says is free of theological error. Um, and that Eastern and Western Catholics uh, agree on. Yeah, St. John Henry Newman, of course, had concerns about Vatican I and the, and the declaration of, of the Pope's infallibility and universal jurisdiction. And it was mostly of a prudential nature that it would lead to this idea of the Pope almost as a demigod. And if you look at what actually happened, at least I would say, in my opinion, it seems almost prophetic because you do end up having popes after this, even saintly popes, who write things of the nature of that a Catholic must agree with the opinions of the Pope. He is the vicar of Christ. That you even And even in Vatican II itself, it talks about the religious submission of mind and will to the Pope that goes beyond just his infallible statements. And so what would be kind of the Eastern approach to this, this idea that we have to... Uh, follow, even agree with, or at least 
not say anything against the even the opinions of the Pope or even just his encyclicals or anything that he talks about, even if it's not covered by that, like you said, limited charism of infallibility. Yeah, I think that uh, our point of departure on this um, is that of Shem and Japheth with regard to their father Noah uh, and not the example of Ham with regard to Noah that he is our father uh, in Christ. And we, he, we owe him uh, religious respect when he speaks. So his voice, um, even if it's not used it within the uh, context of infallibility, um, it nevertheless is a legitimate uh, religious, religious authority on matters of faith and morals, uh, scripture, um, and you know, there is a religious deference that is owed his office. That's first and foremost. Uh, and so with that sent, with that, that conviction, uh, we have to, I really think, be like Shem and Japheth. And to the most, I think, uh, to the most of our ability is to cover our father's naked, our, his drunkenness, um, and not expose it to, uh, to fool and ridicule, but in, in private to, um, uh, you know, urge him to, Dad, we need you. We need a father. Fulfill your office uh, instead of being like Ham, who sees it and, you know, exposes it. Uh, so I, I think that uh, getting back to your, your question uh, directly is um, that there is respect owed it to his statements. Uh, it does not mean, however, that statements which contradict uh, natural law um or divine law, which have, has happened historically, are to be um, uh, swept under the carpet. Um, that is to, you know, gaslight people, and it's to be uh, to sin against truth. Um, so we have a careful balancing act to respect legitimate authority, uh, but to recognize that the 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 overarching primary good is the salvation of souls, and we hinder that universal mandate of all the baptized to help save souls by being dishonest or by giving the impression of being disingenuous. That requires that when uh, things are said which are um, untruthful, that we in charity, as Canon uh, 212 in the Latin Code uh, tells us, uh, correct our father uh, respectfully. Okay. Um, now let's, I want to talk a couple of specifics here. I mean, just an example of, I just thought of while, while you're talking of the, the, the current Holy Father saying something that might be off is that, and it, I think it ties into kind of Eastern, uh, orthodoxy at least, and maybe Catholicism is the, the allowance for communion for divorce and remarried people, which is a big issue in, in the Catholic church obviously in the Catholic church right now. And John Paul II made it very clear that this, that divorce, you know, and remarriage was not legitimate. Um, and that you could not receive communion afterwards. And of course this is the teaching in, in the church, but in the Eastern Orthodoxy, there is some allowance for divorce and remarriage. And so how do the, the Eastern Catholics seem to be in the middle of this somewhat, somewhat, um, how do you, how do Eastern Catholic approach this issue about divorce and remarriage and communion. You know what I'm going to say, Eric, sounds extremely arrogant, but I, I think of what you know. You know, Moses is the author of the first five books of of uh, you know the, the Pentateuch, and you know you find in there the the, the the passage that Moses was you know the humblest of men. So it means <laughs> Moses wrote that. And so humility is truthful, and I think that the Eastern Catholic churches are. It, are living the only uh, model of, of sanity left in the universal church in one sense. Uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, you have Orthodox who are clearly violating, clearly violating the teaching of the early church with regard to divorce and remarriage and communion. Uh, it is a, it was a concession to philandering uh, Byzantine emperors, that uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the patriarch of Constantinople didn't have the moral courage to correct. 
and um, very much like the uh, you may think of um, uh, Cranmer in England, who didn't have the you know the, the initial courage to confront Henry the the Eighth like like uh, Thomas More did, uh, or John Fisher, and so you have now uh, you know an, an 1100, uh, 1200 year old tradition. Uh, coming out of orthodoxy, which tolerates objective evil. And they call it part of the tradition. It's not. When you read, uh, re just read what John Chrysostom has to say on this stuff. Um, so what I mean is that we're, we're kind of like the, the last sane island left in the ocean in one sense, because we at the same time affirm the ancient teaching of the church that you cannot be you know, divorced from your wife attached to another woman, marry her while your, your real wife is still alive, and then receive the body of Christ, it is not acceptable um, by any measure. We maintain that, and the Orthodox do not. On the other hand, uh, when it comes to the, the question of, uh, I, I've lost focus from your question, but uh, when it comes to the issue of of the uh, role of the papacy, the Eastern churches, Eastern Catholic churches maintain this healthy balance, which avoids the maximalism that's currently uh, at play in the church, which sees the, that the, the pure incarnation of Episcopal authority is, and, and, and the pure incarnation of church is in the Pope of Rome. And then bishops are in, in lowering degrees of authority in possession of that to the degree that they're uh, closer to Rome. And, and that, that isn't true. It is from their apostolic succession. The papacy is the visible sign of communion, but it is not the embodiment, uh, the sacramental embodiment, if you could use the word like that, of, um, of, of true churchness. Um, that comes by virtue of uh, of, of, of ordination to the episcopacy from which uh, one becomes a successor to the apostle. And through that, uh, the community, the, the parish, the parishes under him are in communion with the universal church uh, through the Eucharist and through the profession of faith and visibly so by communion with Peter. Um, but what's operative in the, in the, in the Latin church right now is a super maximalist position, which views the papacy as not being the custodian of the deposit of the faith, but rather uh, the inventor of it. And that, that simply is, is inconsistent. So we're at home. We Eastern Catholics are at home uh, in our own flesh, but we're not really at home uh, among the, the, many of the Romans and many of the, the Orthodox, because neither, neither really understand us. Um, so would it be accurate to say, like, when something like this happens, where Francis seems to indicate that divorce and remarry can, can receive communion, uh, that as an Eastern Catholic, you look at that and you just say, that's unfortunate that he says that, but we're just going to keep doing what we've always done, which is that it's not, it's something like that's not allowed. Is that basically kind of how you guys go about it? Yes. Okay. Yes. The, the Pope doesn't have the authority to command us to become Protestants, for example. You know, the Pope doesn't have the authority to command us to go against uh, a conscience which is informed by the perennial apostolic Catholic universal teaching of the church. And, um, you know, there have been popes in, 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 in uh, the past who have, you know, used their authority, let's say, um, legitimate authority, but in an imprudent way, uh, and you can go back to Honorius, you can go back to, uh, you know, uh, Liberius, you can go back to John the 22nd. Um, and uh, the faithful simply at that point have to follow their their conscience, the Aboriginal Christ, as as Newman referred to it. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because uh, Archbishop, soon to be Cardinal Fernandez, who's now in charge of the diaspora of the uh, doctrine of faith, he recently was just interviewing, he was talking about going against the doctrine of the Holy Father. 
And that phrase really mm -hmm. struck me as just, I mean, my, my, I call it my Catholic spidey sense went off. And, yeah, me too. And, I, and I immediately thought of this quote, I'm going to read here from Vatican One. It says, and of course, Vatican One is the one, the, supposedly the council that, that gave all these superpowers to, to the Pope. But it says, for the Holy Spirit was promised to the successors of Peter, not so that they might, by his revelation, make known some new doctrine, but that by his assistance, they might religiously guard and faithfully expound the revelation or deposit of faith transmitted by the apostles. So there is no such thing as a doctrine of the Holy Father that's simply, uh, I mean, because it's like a new thing. But you see this, in, in fact, the Pope himself has talked about change and evolution of doctrine. And I know there's... In the, in the Latin tradition, of course, we, we St. John Henry Newman talks about development of doctrine. How, how do you approach that, the whole issue of, I mean, we, we know the Pope cannot change doctrine, but what about like, this idea of a development of doctrine? That, that seems to be a pretty Latin, Western uh, way of looking at doctrine. How would an Eastern Catholic look at that issue? Well, um, I mean, the, the Eastern churches, Orthodox and Catholic, um, both in theory and in, in praxis, you know, recognize that there is, uh, you know, a, a development in understanding. So, for example, you know, you can look at, you know, the, the term Trinity, which doesn't appear in Scripture, but, you know, and you look at the, the writings of the post-Nicene fathers and you compare them to the writings of the, let's say, the sub-apostolic fathers, and there's a clear development you know, uh, post Nicaea uh, and Constantinople, especially after Basil's Basil's death in 380, uh, Nicaea, uh, Constantinople in 381. You know, you see this this real preponderance of Trinitarian theology uh, based on Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You look at you know the writings at the time of you know uh, Irenaeus, let's say. And uh, you, you obviously you, they're not anti-Trinity. Don't get me wrong, but there's uh, more of a of a kind of a I don't want to say Platonic, but there's an emphasis on God as you know mind, word, breath, you know, and this which are, are very scriptural. But there's a, a a a development in our covenantal understanding of God's self-revelation, um, and that takes you know 400 years. So that's in, in, in regard to Trinitarian theology. And you can give many examples also in, in prayer, you know, with hesychism by the, you know, 11th century, uh, 12th century, uh, 13th century in the, in the East. Uh, you don't find much writing on that in, let's say, the year, you know, uh, 110 AD. You know, it, it, it develops. So there is room for that. But the, the danger is... Um, uh, is that of a bait and switch in the 21st century when they use the word, and I say they, I speak of the modernists and the Christ haters who uh, will speak of a development of doctrine, but what they really mean is a change in doctrine. And I think uh, this is my own belief, but I, I think this were at that point when it's no longer a developing or a deepening of the field, you know, going down deeper and deeper where the seed is planted, but it is a changing of the parameters. Uh, that's no longer development of, of doctrine. Uh, that is what we get into when, when the church teaches us in, in the, in the universal catechism, I think it's paragraph 675 about a, a supreme religious deception, which uses the instrumentality of the church and her voice in order to uh, deliver something which is contrary to what we've always believed at all times. Now, one of the, the big temptations that has arisen, uh, mostly uh, under Pope Francis, among uh, what I'll call conservative, orthodox, traditional Catholics, is the idea that perhaps uh, Francis is not the Pope, said he, the Kantism, the idea that the seat is vacant. And one of the biggest arguments that's being used, and Father Altman, uh, James Altman, just used this recently when he declared that he did not think uh, Jorge Bergoglio was the Pope, is this idea that a Pope, if he is a heretic, if he becomes a heretic, if he's a heretic before he's elected, whatever, but 
by that very, by being a heretic, he's no longer in the church and therefore he is no longer Pope. And that's the, I, I, you know, it's probably a little more complex than that, but that's the basic. Now, what would be your view and like just in generally Eastern Catholic view of the idea of can the Pope be a heretic? And if he is or if he isn't, is there a way to depose him? And and this whole idea that that's kind of surrounds this the city of uh viewpoint. Yeah, it's very unfortunate with Father Altman and it was unfortunate the way he was treated, but it was it's unfortunate the way that he's reacted to this. And I see the reaction of the city of the contests to be akin to that of the, you know, the, the, the children who uh, disowned their alcoholic father. You know, it, it's easier simply to say he's not my dad than to acknowledge him as your dad with the shame that goes with it and the hard work that goes with uh, restoring your father to his, his dignity. And uh, so it, I think there's a tendency to simply extricate yourself from the cross that we Catholics are on right now by saying it's not real. He's not really the Pope. He's not my father in Christ. It's not my mess to deal with. Um, I think the, 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 the problem is, is that there's an element of Protestantism in this, in that we, these people usurp uh, an authority which is not proper to them. I don't have the authority to declare that, you know, Pope Francis isn't the Pope. That's not my authority. It's an exercise in uh, vanity, vainglory, and pride, all shook together, pressed down, and flowing over. That's what we're facing with this. Uh, the That authority, that decision rests with those who have uh, bigger hats than we wear, bigger hats than what Father Altman wears. Uh, that rests with a decision of, uh, you know, the cardinals and uh, uh, those whose office obliges them to resolve this issue. Until then, uh, I think we have to, you know, defer to the uh, authority of the church, which obviously says that he is Pope. Um, and there's no sin incurred um, by us in, in doing that. Um, but we, we really overstep the limits of our authority by aggregating to ourselves uh, the voice to say that this person's Pope, this person isn't Pope. Uh, then everybody can be Pope. I mean, you can have a guy out in Kansas named Michael who's Pope. You can have a guy up in Quebec, I think Gregory the 18th now, uh, I met him once a few decades ago, who claims to be the Pope. Why not? I mean, um, we have to be respectful of, of authority. Otherwise, I mean, it, it, everything comes apart. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question. No, and I, I follow up though to that is, do you think there is a way that a pope can be deposed while living or declared not to be a pope, whatever the word is, because, of course, now we're talking about some of the dangers of conciliarism, which you mentioned earlier, the idea that a council is above the pope and therefore a council could come together. I came to a council and say this person is no longer the pope. Do you think there is because I've struggled with this in my own answer is I don't know, um, but I think there's a lot of different options. Do you think there is a mechanism currently in the church that could legitimately depose uh, a pope for heresy or whatever the case may be? There is a mechanism, but then that risks opening up um, an equal and opposite evil uh, problem. So people need to go back and visit uh, the Council of Constance in uh, the 1400s and uh, it was never resolved. The, the, um, the mess that it created, um, the Pope who, so there was an anti-Pope. Um, they gather, the bishops gather, and they, they ask these three competing Popes just to resign, um, and they elect you know, a new Pope. The new Pope comes, and then he turns on the very mechanism that got him elected, okay? And so, um, for obvious reasons. But that mechanism worked. It, it got the church out of a, a horrible situation, which the Holy Roman Emperor didn't like, the people didn't like, nobody liked it. And you had all these anti-popes, and that's where we're going with, with the, the city of Vacantists. Uh, all of these anti-popes running around, Council of Constance comes together and resolves it, but it creates this uh, hydra of now, of conciliarism. And then I think it was Pope Martin that is elected. And then he sees it 
and he cuts the knees off, the kneecaps off of it. Uh, but since then, they just kind of went on, the churches went on and, and dealt with all the problems of, of saving souls. But theologically, I personally, uh, Eric, I don't know of a case of someone who has gone back and resolved that problem, which uh, is, is real, that you had a council which did depose uh, anti-popes, and one of them had to be the pope. Um, I, it, it exists, but it's kind of like resorting to, um, you know, uh, putting a, a toxin to, to remove a tumor on your, on your uh, liver. Uh, you can do it. It's going to get rid of the tumor. But now you're, you, you may have a, a bigger beast in your belly. Yeah, it seems like in a, I think this happened to Constance, at least. And I think if I remember correctly, one of the uh, the, the one that the Catholic Church, at least now, recognizes as the true pope at the time. I can't remember the names. I think he did agree to resign. The Avignon pope, who we look at as, as an anti-pope now, he refused. And then the third pope, uh, I believe he initially refused, but then he ended up agreeing. And I feel like that might be the only way it would happen would be if a council got together and said to the Pope, we w- we're, we're asking you, all of us, to resign. And then the Pope actually would resign. Then it kind of skips through the hoops because the Pope didn't technically get deposed. He was just strongly encouraged to be to to resign because we know pope can resign i feel like that might be the only way at least that we know of right now because then the, the council's not above the pope but the pope is you know yeah there like you yeah. said there's, there's there's problems on each side that, that 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 can arise in these situations right um you know we we do have you know there, there are there were two means to resolve situations like this now there's only one you know, the, the, the two means at, at disposal to, to resolve these situations were, you know, the temporal power of the emperors and the, uh, the more difficult one, which is the Holy Spirit working through the sanctification of, of the lay faithful. Um, with the, 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 since the time of, of Constantine until, you know, the First World War, basically, We've had uh, Christian emperors or people who at least claim to be Christian and who exerted considerable uh, power. And they could use that power for their own uh, aggrandizement, and uh, they often did. Uh, Or they could often use it for the good of the church, you know, forcing, you know, warring factions in the church into a room, locking them in there and not letting them out until they get their story straight and elect someone to be the Pope. Um, you know, we don't have the luxury of a Christian emperor uh, to apply and leverage external pressure on the sinful men who are dealing with this, the, the human aspect of this divine institution. It doesn't exist anymore. And so we're in, in terra incognita. We're not in known land. Uh, we Catholics in the past century. Um, there is no kind of uh, policeman on the schoolyard uh, to, to keep wayward churchmen in line. So what's left? And this is the, the, the one that involves the heavy lifting. What's left is not to deny the evil, not like don't gaslight it. Don't say, hey, everything's fine. The Pope's not teaching any in the air. Everything's, everything's wonderful. The answer is that we priests and faithful and bishops obviously have to be uncompromisingly committed to our baptism to really be serious about getting the Holy Spirit, uh, having as St. Seraphim the Seraph says, you know, to, to be in possession of the Holy Spirit, um, to become saints. And that is a great motivation for fathers. You're a father, I'm a father, uh, and when you see that your children are outdoing you, uh, boy, that gets you in motion. I can't let that happen. I'm the dad. There's Even if it's pride motivating you, it doesn't matter. It really puts you in motion. And uh, that's, that's what we have to do. Uh, we have to recognize that we, we don't have any authority uh, over 
these men in the church, like, you know, you can talk about the, the new uh, Cardinal designate uh, Fernandez and some of the things he says, we have no authority to stop him. We have no authority for him to make up terms like the doctrine of the Holy Father. There's only the doctrine of Christ. That's it. Um, what we do have authority over is, well, e even that is limited, is our own lives. I mean, all, God ultimately does. We don't have much authority over our own lives, but we can control uh, whether we're going to get up and say our prayers in the morning. We can determine if we're going to uh, speak charitably or deceptively. Uh, and I think this is a, a long road, but it's really ultimately the only answer because it involves sanctification. Uh, the other answers to these questions get back to questions of jurisdiction, of external power, and that leads to frustration because 99% of the church uh, are people who don't have holy orders. They have no power uh, or authority uh, to affect an outcome in that. So what, what can they do? They can be serious about becoming saints. Honestly, I think that's a great way to end this. I, I, I'm very happy that you said that. I think that's that's exactly the path forward for the van. If there is a cardinal listening, he can maybe do something different beyond. I mean, he, he should be try to become a saint too. But you know, he might have actually authority to do something more. But we we don't, and I think that's that's important to remember. And what we have authority to do is to be holy, uh, to, to, to become a saint. Now, before I let you go, though, I want to give you an opportunity. I know you've been doing a lot to help. Uh, Ukrainian refugees with the you know crisis going on over there, the war going on over there. Could you tell us just real quickly uh, about what you're doing and, and how people can help? Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, pray, um, have masses offered for, for peace, for the war to end. Um, have, have masses offered, uh, liturg divine liturgies offered um, for the orphans, the widows, their souls. You know, my wife's hometown uh, yesterday, uh, uh, you know, a young man was brought home. Um, in Lviv, an orphan was brought to the church of St. Peter and Paul. He has no relatives were there for him. The people came out. They became his relatives uh, to pray for the repose of his soul. Um, so it's first and foremost, our obligation is... Uh, order to the kingdom of God and the salvation of souls, and that's prayer. Secondly, um, is just to, uh, uh, if you can, you know, send in, I mean, uh, I hate to say it, but just like, like money. With, with money, uh, they're able to buy the, you know, the food, the medical supplies that the, uh, the injured need. Um, I, I mean, you can send it to me if you want. I just, whatever I get, I just send it you know, straight over. I have a, a doctor friend who um, is doing everything she can to, you know, to help these people, their widows, the orphans that um, come to her for help. And uh, the priests that I know over there, um, you know, the, our patriarch, I met with him and uh, he has a, um, uh, a charity called Mudri Sprav, meaning wise works. And uh, he helps the priests because the priests, uh, the NGOs, you know, they're, 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 they're useless. It is uh, the, the church, the, the sisters and the priests who are in the front line, who know the families. Uh, that's where the help is being uh, delivered because they know the names, they know the families, they know what's real, what's not real. Um, and uh, so our, our patriarch in, in, in Kiev, uh, Svetoslav Shepchuk of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, um, he, uh, he offers, he offers a lot of help. And, um, so you can give them my contact and, uh, anything that I receive, I can give to my Bishop. And I know he gives a hundred percent. He doesn't take anything off it. Uh, he gives it directly to our, our patriarch who, who, uh, gives it to where it's, it's needed, but thank you. Please, please pray. Uh, please don't look at this through the principle, the, the language of, of politics and personalities, but simply through the lens of, of principles, you know, of, a of, a an unjust war. And we, we don't want people to die. We just want justice to be done and we want peace and we want, um, we want this to end. And in the meantime, we're busy taking care of the, uh, the thousands of orphans and the, 
you know, the widows who, who grieve, you know, the loss of their, their loved ones. Okay. And I'll put a link uh, in the show notes to your, your being able to donate through you. Cause I know it all, we, we can be confident. Anybody watching, listening to this knows if it goes to you. It's not going to you. It's going straight to people who actually are in need. And so I know yes. a lot of times we get, especially with these big ones, big tragedies or Christ, whatever it's, you know, a lot of money ends up getting wasted. And, and so a lot of people don't give because of that. And I, I, I understand yeah. that, but in this case, you know, we know, okay, going through you, it's going to get to, to actual people that, that need. Yeah. That. If they just put on the memo there, uh, orphans, Ukraine, uh, 730 Washington Avenue, Carnegie, Pennsylvania, one, five, one, zero, six, father, Jason Sharon. Then I just, uh, I cash that. And I literally, I just money gram it to people, priests and uh, the doctor I trust. I've known them for 20 years. I've went over three times and I've been impressed with what they've done with how little they've received considering all things. So uh, that's okay. where it goes. Very good. Very good. Okay. Well, I'm going to let you go here, Father. I know you're, you're a busy man. You got a lot going on. Uh, until next time, everybody, God love you.